Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to today's show. Now, in the past, I've done uh, interviews uh, with individuals and groups uh, looking at the topic of what is a clinical laboratory scientist. And this typically goes on during the annual Lab Week observance. Now, today, I want to go ahead and narrow the topic to the specialty of microbiology in the clinical laboratory. So joining me today to discuss the clinical laboratory scientist in microbiology and his fairly new podcast, Let's Talk Micro, is Luis Plaza. Hey, Luis, welcome to the program. Hi, Robert. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you're more than welcome. Um, Luis, let's go ahead and start out with a little bit of background on you and your career as a clinical laboratory scientist. Um, how long have you been a clinical laboratory scientist? Well, I have been a clinical laboratory scientist for about almost nine years. Uh, before then, I was a uh, medical lab technician mm -hmm. for six years, but I only practiced about four of those. Okay. And um, uh, how many years have you been doing clinical microbiology? Uh, about seven years. Okay. So you, you've been around the block then, um, yes. and hence uh, having the knowledge to do a podcast on this topic. Um, can you share with the audience... Uh, what does it take to become a clinical laboratory scientist? Well, as far as the you know, uh, the education, there are several pathways that you can do. There's the the one that I did, which is like the what they call the two plus two. Mm -hmm. So you do it's a bachelor's in clinical lab science. So you do two years of undergrad and prerequisite studies, and then you do two years of clinical laboratory science courses, uh, and that includes an internship. There are also like a three plus one, there's a four plus one where you already have a bachelor's degree. And then you go in and you do an internship. Um, some of my classmates, they already had a, a bachelor's degree and then they do the two years of the MLS portion and they get their degree in clinical laboratory sciences. Okay, and this is a very heavy science curriculum, right? Uh, yes, it is. In order to get into the program, um, you definitely need to take like biology, microbiology, chemistry, and organic chemistry. Yeah, and then there's a number of other classes that are really required. And then, of course, you go through an, uh, a rotation in which you actually spend time in clinical hematology, cl clinical urinalysis, mm -hmm. clinical chemistry, right? Yes, correct. So you start with, so you, like the first year is like the, like the theory portion. So you take um, urinalysis and body fluids, hematology, clinical chemistry, blood bank coagulation, and microbiology. And then once you have completed those, depending on the program, then you go you know, to the clinical setting, and then you spend anywhere from three to four weeks in each area. Yeah. <clears throat> and and uh, depending on the state, it may require a licensure, uh, but no matter where you work, it's you know it's good to get certified with one of the major organizations, right? Yes, definitely. Uh, typically, when you when you complete the program, you know they prepare you, and the one that uh, we take, you know, seems to be the most the people takes the the ASCP for the American Society for Clinical Pathology. Um, there is state licensure in some states, including Florida here, but typically once you have your ASCP certified. That you have taken that examination, you know, you fill your paperwork and then you apply for the license. So there's no additional testing. Right. Um, going back real quick to the subject of clinical lab scientists, I know here in Florida, um, there's a certification, the American Association of Bioanalysts. So typically, um, uh, you know, they already have a, someone has the bachelor's degree, they complete an MLT program, then they take the certification. And then they can be licensed as a medical lab scientist here in Florida and some other states. Yeah, you know, um, when I first started in the laboratory back in the early 80s, <laughs> um, my first two years was as a night shift generalist. And I was able to get away from that and uh, find my way into the microbiology laboratory. And I, I never looked back. I never worked in another department you know, since 1985. Um, Luis, can you explain your interest in microbiology and what does it take to be a successful clinical microbiologist? 
Yeah, so just uh, like I have worked in other areas. Uh, when I started as a medical uh, laboratory technician, I did a little bit of everything. It was just a small lab. So we did, you know, a little bit of hematology, blood banking, and there was some micro. And that's when my interest started. I don't know. It is just like blood banking, which I like too. It's, it's the mystery of it. I like how, you know, you have all these clues and then, you know, you see your organisms, your reactions, and it definitely involves a lot of knowledge that you have to know, you know, whether your organisms are pathogenic versus skin flora, the source. Mm -hmm. So that's what really attracted me to it. I, it's just, you really need to, there, there's a lot of components involved to it, which in order to be a successful one, you definitely need to read, uh, you know, first is repetition. Like you only get proficient at this by reading cultures, doing the testing over and over again. And then the other component, it's reading. Definitely have to make sure that you use your sources, you know, of course, read your policy and procedures, and then go and even like read your, you know, your CLSI for your antimicrobial, you know, breakpoints, your ASM books about, you know, get familiar with all the organisms and their reactions. And that will make you a really good microbiologist. That way, you know, knowing your organisms, reaction source, how your media works, it will definitely make it easier and it, it reduces the time for results to be completed. Yeah, I, I know when, uh, I mean, getting to see the plates over and over and over is just, is, is just so necessary. And I, I know when, uh, when I used to have students and they would just be so astounded when you're able to look at a plate and say, oh yeah, that's Pseudomonas or yeah, that's Klebsiella or whatever. They're like, how do you know that? Well, you know, because that's what I do, <laughs> but yeah. So just seeing the plates, um, like you said, repetitively, it becomes tattooed on your brain, really. Um, Luis, what's the typical day of a CLS in the clinical micro lab? Well, that, uh, it typically varies with the, with the size of your lab. So if you're in a smaller facility, you know, you can typically might start by taking temperatures, you know, documenting all your instruments, you know, your, all your daily maintenance, if you have to do like your weekly, your monthly. And then after that, you know, perform QC on your test. And then if it's a smaller lab, you typically do that. And then if they do plate reading, you'll do that as well. Uh, once you get to the, if it's a larger facility, it's more compartmentalized. So you'll be doing some of those, but then you might be doing like all the antigen or PCR testing all day. And then if you're reading cultures, um, you will be doing that all day. So making sure with the flow, you typically will work anything that already has susceptibilities. So it's ready to be resulted. And then you will proceed to those that maybe, you know, you didn't have enough to do anything on them. So you had to sub subculture them. Well, they call the too young or further workups. And then you move on to what they call the new stuff. So you know, it was like, you know, set up the day before and it hasn't been read yet. So, so Luis, what, where do you see the clinical microbiology laboratory uh, going in coming years? Um, more, uh, more um, molecular methods or where do you see it going? Yes, definitely, definitely molecular. Um, before years ago, when I started, uh, you know, for a great example, it's like the stool cultures, you know, they used to be, you know, plated, you had all your media to make sure that, you know, your salmonella, your campylobacter, your shigella. And then nowadays you just run a panel. And then once you get a positive, then you will subculture it um, or send the sample to the state. Uh, but definitely that's a great example. So parasitology, there are more molecular uh, tests out there. So definitely that and a lot of automation, but you know, like now, as we keep going more instruments, they can plate the cultures for you. Um, there's even, you know, some sy systems out there that they actually, you know, everything's attached to so it's like a setup and then attached to the incubators. And then once the culture is ready, you know, it will flag you and then you get to read it. So definitely a lot of, um, a lot of instruments and definitely molecular. Yeah, and I just wanted to go ahead and share with the audience. There, there's a lot of different types of jobs you can do too with this 
with this skill. I mean, it's not just hospitals. There's the commercial labs. Uh, there's the public health lab. Um, a lot of uh, CLSs with microbiology experience going to infection control, um, quality control. So there, there's a lot of different areas teaching. Um, so there's a lot of different things you can do with it. So, and it's just a very interesting topic. And it, it, it's kept me hanging on for, for many, many years. Well, Luis, I want to go ahead and switch gears to your podcast. Let's Talk Micro. I found it on, uh, on Twitter, and I've listened to a number of episodes. Um, why'd you start it? Well, I started it for several reasons. I think one of them is definitely that I like to, you know, in my nature, I like to teach and I like to learn. And I think that that's been one of the challenges in, in my work. It's just like sometimes, you know, you want to learn. And then sometimes, you know, not everyone wants to teach and it makes it difficult. So I want to make sure that if I know something, I just want to share it out there because it comes back to being a good clinical lab scientist. The more information you have, the better you're at your job. So I definitely, you know, I love talking micro. People have always told me that. So I like that. And at the same time, you know, it makes me, you know, doing the research for the podcast. It makes me study, become more proficient, definitely learn more. Um, connect with other um, professionals in this field. So that's that's one of the goals. The other one is, at the same time, bring awareness to the clinical lab science profession. Right. So, Luis, um, what's the, what's the format of my your... classmates' experiences? Oh, I'm sorry, you're, you're breaking up on me, Luis. Okay, go ahead. So bring them, bring awareness to the clinical lab sciences profession. Um, a lot of, you know, the people in our profession, they basically find out by accident, either, you know, they're ready to finish their degree and someone that they know that, or they hear that there's this program about what we do. So I want to bring awareness to, about my, our profession. Yeah. Yeah. You're doing a great job at it too. W what's your format? Well, the format is I, I do a combination of, I use several resources, you know, like textbooks. And also, um, I reference like books from the American society of microbiology, which, you know, we use in our labs, um, just to build the background about the organisms and their reactions, all the technical definitions. And I combine it with my experiences. So what I seen, you know, maybe. A certain media works better for an organism. You know, like I like to say in the podcast, like, a, you know, like for example, like PEA, you use it for gram positive organisms, but yes, Pseudomonas, it's, you know, it's a great media to isolate it. So bring all the things that I've seen and you know, I'll combine it with that. Also, I like to do some interviews with some uh, microbiologists outside of what I do, which is clinical micro. So like you said before, you know, there are many ways that we can contribute in this profession. You know, we can work with instruments, you know, public health labs, um, environmental micro. Right. So definitely bring people from other areas. And then I'm also talking about like, if I see an article that pertains to our profession, I also, I try to contact the authors and see if they can come on and discuss it. Yeah. So, so can, yeah, when I was checking out the um, several of your podcasts, the first thing that hit me was this is like the Bailey and Scott uh, <laughs> clinical micro book. I mean, the fact that you can talk about the oxidase test for a half hour is just astounding. Um, it is challenging. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's really impressive. Um, so what was your most recent interview? Who did you talk to? Well, actually, the last episode was a really great interview uh, about an, an organism that's uh, uh, called Staphylococcus argentus, mm -hmm. which is really, you know, it, it resembles Staph aureus. It's actually part of the Staphylococcus aureus complex. Uh, it resembles it, you know, morphology, hemolysis, and also in biochemicals. And then the challenge to this organism was that it seems that it might be around more than we think it is, but the instruments that we have, they don't identify. So I brought two, you know, co-directors from the Mayo Clinic, which they um, published an article on the on the American Society of Microbiology journals, 
and they came on to discuss a study where they had some organisms that they were originally identified as staph warriors and upon further testing, they were identified as Staphylococcus argentus. And then, you know, we also talked about how to interpret susceptibilities with this, how to report it. So we provide the accurate, you know, the accurate information to the physicians and they don't think that it is maybe like a coagulase negative staph or, or a recommensal organism. Mm -hmm. Oh, pretty interesting stuff. <clears throat> now, per perhaps my favorite episode is you dedicated a whole episode to Pastorella <laughs> and why it's your favorite organism. And I, I've never really thought about what my favorite organism is. So I thought it was interesting that you did. Um, can you give the audience a Reader's Digest version of this podcast without giving away the whole show? <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, you know, that all started when someone on Instagram, I said, I like to say it's my favorite. And then someone on Instagram said, hey, you should do an episode about it. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, hey, you know, that's an idea. Um, what I like about it, it comes to what I like about microbiology, which is that you need to know a lot of information um, you know, these organisms, they don't, like we like to say, they don't read textbooks. So, we know about pastorella, for example, it teaches text that not everything that does not grow McConkey agar, it's a gram-negative run. I mean, I have seen incompetencies and that they fail because they assume that it's maybe a gram-positive cocci or run because, you know, it's not a McConkey. That's where the whole, you know, educating yourself and reading, you know, comes in play. So I like it also because it was one of those unusual ones in the sense that when you're in school, you tend to cover one you know, of your classics, you know, Staph aureus, E. coli, Pseudomonas. So definitely you might hear about it. You hear it maybe like in lecture, but then when you see it, I don't know, to me, it's just, it's, it's fascinating. Also with the reactions, you know, both indole and oxidase, you know, it makes it unusual. And uh, that, those are some of the things that I like about it. But yeah, like you say, you know, for more information, you know, you can go ahead and check out the episode, all the listeners oh, yeah. out there. Yeah, definitely. And again, the podcast is called Let's Talk Micro with host Luis Plaza. And I'll go ahead and link to it um, in the show notes when I publish the podcast. And I encourage anybody with any interest in microbiology, medical technology, or clinical laboratory science uh, to check it out. It's good stuff. Uh, Luis puts a lot of work into it, and uh, I can definitely appreciate that. And I want to thank you, Luis Plaza, for sharing your thoughts and your experiences uh, with uh, me and the audience today. And good luck with the new podcast. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you so much, Robert. You better.